Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Dr. Drew Remignanti and Dr. Bill Lines. Thank you for joining us today, Drew and Bill. Thanks for having us, Kim. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, so while I usually start by saying how we met, which would be LinkedIn, <laughs> as yeah. is often the case, and uh, yeah. we have so much to talk about that I'm going to let uh, you guys introduce yourselves shortly. And instead here, I thought I'd share a few things that the three of us have discovered that we have in common through our communications. Uh, so we've all had multiple articles published by Kevin MD, and we've all done podcasts with Kevin as well. And we all have extensive experience on both sides of the table as healthcare professionals and patients with significant medical issues. And we have both had some thoughts surrounding our identity. Uh, like, are we a doctor, a PT, a urologist, even when we're no longer practicing? And also, all three of us have a faith life that is important to us, um, though we all practice different denominations and religions. Uh, so today we'll be talking about each of your journeys and what has helped you most in moving forward at times you have struggled and your writing publications. Uh, so I was wondering what you'd most like our audience to know about you as we begin our conversation. And uh, Drew, why don't we start with you? Okay. I One of the reasons I connected with a bunch of people on LinkedIn is I did write a book at the end of my career. In fact, I finished my 40-year career in emergency medicine. I was incredibly alarmed at the trajectory that U.S. healthcare was taking. And I knew I was not, even though I was going to retire, and I did in April of 20, I wasn't going to stop thinking about healthcare issues, especially because I could not retire from my patient condition. Mm -hmm. So I decided to try to put some thoughts down in a book and have been trying to uh, make promote awareness of that so people can read some of my observations. Hmm. So while you're sharing that, I'll hold up your book, which you sent well, to you. me. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, it's called The Healing Connection, A Partnership for Your Health. And I loved everything about it. Um, I love the the title. I love the cover. Um, you know, you talk about what it's really like to be an ER doctor, some of the best, some of the worst, what goes through the mind of an ER doctor, uh, your personal recovery from stroke. And um, I'll, I'll just read the last sentence on the, the back here. It says, the book provides a research-based extended argument for the enduring importance of the patient-physician relationship, which is currently threatened by its conversion to a less effective consumer-provider relationship. And that says a lot. So yeah, well, so we'll get into you got your publications uh, uh, a little bit later. Uh, so Bill, what would you like the audience most to know about you? Well, I'm a physician, a urologist, and um, I am a survivor of uh, mental health issues and, uh, and suicide uh, attempts. And um, I'm also an author of the things that you've mentioned, but I also write medical, primarily medical fiction. Um, uh, I have a book called A Surgeon's Knot and uh, several other books, but uh, um, I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a father and I'm a Christian, as you sort of alluded to, and uh, that's pretty much what I would like you to know. Well, I'm grateful to have you both on today. Uh, so as we um, get started, uh, I know that Bill wanted to discuss a recent contact he had with an administrator, if you remember about that. Um, it was it was related yeah. to fixing all the problems centering around removing physicians from the decision making progress uh, process. Right, right. Well, just sort of an introduction. I think that um, maybe over the last thirty years, there's been a deterioration in the patient doctor relationship, and it's sort of paralyzed paralleled the uh, deterioration of the healthcare system in the United States and. Um, I happened to be at a Bible study, uh, and uh, we were, you know, having pizza, and I and I sat next to a person who, um, a man who uh, I I didn't know, and uh, he was a little reluctant to talk to me at first, and um, uh, eventually he opened up and he and he told me that he happened to be an administrator for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, which is the same medical group that I was a partner in, in 
Uh, he didn't know I was a doctor. I don't, I don't believe, but uh, I mentioned to him that uh, I think that Kaiser has a lot of problems. Uh, and he sort of in a glorified manner told me he, he had the solution to all those problems. And, and that solution was to uh, not have physicians make any of the healthcare decisions. And I, I'm embarrassed because I was really angry uh, in, inside. And I stood up because I had to go to another part of the room uh, for just happened to be having to leave. And I said to him, no, you're wrong. The problem with Kaiser is that they have no doctor patient relationship. And I sort of, I guess I sort of stomped away because as I was leaving, uh, I heard over my, over my shoulder, a, a friend of mine say, well, you, you know, he's a doctor. So I, I, I guess it, it, it sort of made pressure on, on the group. Uh, but um uh, I, I've never seen the man since then. It turns out that I, I didn't mention, but he he was a long time administrator in Kaiser Permanente, um, and I'm, I'm thinking in like 30 years, and he he's still there. Uh, and um, so that's that's the anecdote that I described to you uh, to you all. And Bill, I mean, Drew, what did that bring up for you? When that, I, I, I have a similar I have, I have a similar quote in my book from a CEO of a couple billion dollar healthcare system in which in a business journal, she was asked once, what's one conviction in healthcare that needs to be challenged? And her answer was that patients need a primary care doctor. They need a primary, they need primary care, but not necessarily a physician relationship. So I was delighted that she was willing to say that out loud. I'm delighted to hear what your contact said, Bill, but I'm equally frightened that they're not afraid to say these things out loud any longer. Everybody's just assuming that it's a given that dollar-driven decisions are are tent, you know, are ascendant now, and patient-centered decision making has to take a back seat to dollar-driven decision making. Can you imagine it during any one of the three of our trainings if they said to us, "Okay, we're going to take a pause here today. Now the business people are going to come in and tell you how important it is for you to spend very little time with your patients. You need to spend the least amount of time possible with your patients in order to generate a bill, and then get out of the room and go on to the next patient." Now that things mindset, have really, really deteriorated. Yes. That mindset has been so gradually incremental that we didn't see it coming. And but here it is. Yes. And it's an accepted yes. part of healthcare now. Yes. Yes. I um I have a um I have a psychiatrist actually who's been seeing me for over 25 years. And uh he um uh, he's in private practice and uh he um uh, we, we had this discussion of we, we do quite often when I see him uh, about patient doctor relationship and uh, his feeling is that uh, it is a deterioration of that relationship, which is really explains all the problems in healthcare. And with him practicing at this time, you know, he's, he's immersed in these problems, but he, he described one uh, incident uh, to me uh, that he had had recently. Uh, he is associated with a health, uh, organization um, in which which is run by um, I guess he'd be the CEO and he's a social worker uh, and the social worker wanted to admit a patient to the hospital which is across the street from his practice um, just just admit him and then of course expect the physicians to take care of him he needed acute psychiatric care uh, this person and um, uh, he he was uh, he was surprised that uh, he he got backlash about that. Uh, he uh, evidently wasn't familiar with the fact that there are uh, uh, privileges uh, that are required to admit people uh, to a hospital, uh, and I guess you know ultimately wasn't really aware of the legal um, relationship, uh, the contract uh, that goes between a, a, a physician and a patient when they are admitted for care in a hospital. Uh, so uh, as, as I understand, they were able to clear this up, uh, but it's only a matter of time uh, till uh, people like that will be expecting uh, admission privileges at hospitals.
you know, they, they want it to become equivalent to checking into a hotel. What what does the consumer want? You know, the that business co concept of the customer is always right, just as no applicability in, in healthcare. We're not always right as customers, as patients. I know because I ignored my stroke warning symptoms until I, right up until the moment I had my stroke. So, mm -hmm. and if they, removing the doctors from the decision-making process enables you to check more people into the hotel, deliver more services, charge more money, make more money. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, doing, oh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Say, I mean, medicine, medicine in, in, in the United States is a business, uh, but it is much more than that. Uh, we have patients uh, and um, I, I think that's the problem is that they, they put business models uh, which don't really work uh, in the healthcare setting. So I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's okay. You're a hundred percent correct in that. Uh, and when, since Drew mentioned his stroke, I thought you could both share a little for our audience. Not everyone has had the privilege of meeting you both yet. And you both had significant um personal and professional struggles. And I was just wondering if you each wanted to give a little background, Drew, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I'll just complete mine. My aunt had a chronic autoimmune disease going back to age 19. And people have asked me, gee, did you go into, did you want to become a doctor because of your chronic disease? I said, no, I wanted to do it despite my chronic disease. I had a sequence, my three-part illness, a decade of ulcerative colitis, then followed by my stroke, which was a rare complication of my ulcerative colitis, despite the fact that I already had my colon out. Now a chronic liver disease, which is a continuation of that same process. I don't know what's best for me as a patient. And, uh, you know, I don't want to check into a hotel and have give, be given a menu of things to choose from. I want a physician who gets yeah. to know me, who, who I can trust, who I feel known by, who guides me to make my decisions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hundred percent. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> well, uh, for me, let me just uh, re reinforce what Drew said in terms of um, treating yourself, or I, I treat myself very often, and I we, I put things off, off till the end. And and what what happened to me is uh, I went to Mexico with my family. When I came back, I didn't feel well, but I uh, typical of me, I did nothing about it. Um, and I woke up one night with shaking chills and fever. And uh, within a couple of hours, I was intubated uh, in uh, Kaiser Riverside, my my hospital's uh, intensive care unit in respiratory failure from septic shock. And uh, I was on a ventilator in the intensive care unit for a total of six weeks. And um, with the whole constellation of problems associated with septic, septic shock um, um, and uh, tracheostomy I had to have, and I lost 40 pounds and, um, it, it, it was good. And I, I realized what it's like to be in intensive care unit, but it, it, it was devastating, catastrophic for me. Um, I did go back to work. Uh, but, uh, about a year later, I had a snowboarding accident, uh, stupid me, uh, thinking I can snowboard and, um, <laughs> I ended up in intensive care unit, uh, again, and had like five facial surgeries for facial fractures and, and jaw wired and lost 40 pounds again, had a tracheostomy again. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I recovered and then I went back to work. Uh, but um, then this sort of segues into my mental health problems. I, I never was the same and had a black, horrible depression that did not resolve. And I tried to commit suicide three times. And I've been retired since my last attempt suicide in 2003. It's yeah. quite a road, Bill. It is. So I'm wondering what has helped you both, um, helped you move forward at times that you've struggled. Well, I, I think part of it for me is I'm, you know, I, I you could put a gloss on it and say I'm a, a resilient, persistent person. But I think uh, if you were being, if I was being honest about it, I would say it's sort of an inborn and an adopted mule-headed stubbornness, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I'm an optimist by by disposition and by choice. And I think, you know, the, you know, I, I always look for the the way forward, which I think is a good thing for patients to do regardless of their situation. 
Well, and you had mentioned that it took you five years to get back um, to practicing in the ER. And while you were recovering, you went and got a master's in public health. Yeah, I, I again, it was a stubbornness. I mean, if I was going to leave emergency medicine, which I did enjoy doing, I wanted to do it on my own terms, which I was able to do ultimately. Um, so the stubbornness and persistence, optimism and hope, I think has a lot to do with it as well. It affects all diseases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Bill? What helped you? Um, when I when I left practice, I, I was actually, you know, I was really destroyed. And uh, I had a lot of my self-image wrapped up in being a practicing physician. And uh, for maybe 17 years, I really didn't think I was a physician. I mean, I had a license, but uh, and um, I was I was a hermit. Uh, but um I, I, I had a revelation that, um, uh, I, I went to a meeting and I met somebody who had written, uh, an article, uh, about her mental health problems. So she, she's a physician and, uh, she sort of encouraged me to do that. And in, uh, 2017, I wrote the last day, uh, which, uh, is a, uh, a chron it chronicles my last day of medical practice and, uh, it was published uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And opening up, uh, especially to my fellow physicians, was extremely um, uh, revealing for me. It, um, it allowed me to realize that I was a physician uh, and uh, to really be back in uh, the, the physician's community. And uh, something about coming out, uh, people use that term for other things too, but coming out in my case, uh, that I was a suicide uh, attempt survivor uh, to really, well, you know, with our system, it's it's the world. And uh, it, uh, it was really helpful, therapeutic for me. Um, and then of course, of course my, my religion has been extremely helpful as, as well for, for, for that. But that's sort of my, things that have helped me hmm. so drew when we were the three of us were communicating this weekend you said something and i'm i uh, thinking it's okay uh if i share what you typed though the thing that striked that struck you okay sure, um, go right ahead. okay ahead. thanks so uh you said both bill and i were hit pretty hard with health challenges legitimately life-threatening ones but each chose to nevertheless return to the practice of medicine where wiser men might have bowed out right then. I'm particularly impressed, Bill, by your succeeding in still walking the earth after your back-to-back -back trifecta of serious medical emergency followed by a significant trauma emergency, then a mental health emergency to boot with depression and suicidality. I think that speaks to physicians taking on an identity and responsibility with our training and career commitment that is uniquely all encompassing. And I'm wondering if you'd both like to speak to that because I thought that was really powerful the way you said that. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I, I thank you, Drew, for those kind of com comments. And um, I think both of our cases really, we're not that um, atypical. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I use this term, um, uh, a um, overwork, um, I forget what I say now, but uh, is basically a condition of overwork um, where we, we overwork to get into medical school, we overwork to get into residency, we overwork in residency for sure. And, and then that spills over into um, our practices. And I think that the, the physicians as a group are sort of evolutionarily uh, selected as people who are hard working. Uh, medicine is a noble profession. And I think that uh, the, the majority, the great majority of physicians um, are, are really, they're, they're, they are, they're noble and uh, they really, really want uh, to, to help people and uh, uh, to heal people. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I'm proud, I'm very proud to be a physician. And uh, so I thank you again for those kind words. Very well. You're welcome. And I think it's anyone who works in healthcare pretty quickly developed during their training to develop, well, 
I need to learn how to get it right on behalf of patients. I need to learn what's the right thing to do for this patient. It's not necessarily the same for everybody who has this condition. In this person's case, they need the typical care plus this. So getting it right on behalf of patients it becomes priority number one to all of us who work in healthcare. And the problem nowadays is that not to minimize how important, how difficult and challenging it is to successfully run and finance a, a medical business, whether you're running your private practice or the hospital or a multi-hospital system. I'm sure that takes a lot of financial know-how and challenge, but there comes a point where the contrast between getting it right for the patient and getting it right for the finances has to diverge. And, uh, and we've reached the point where we've decided as a society, it's okay for financially based decisions, dollar driven decisions to take precedence over patient welfare decisions. And we have to reverse that decision. We A lot of patients don't realize that decision has already been made for all of us. We need to unmake that decision and say, no, patient welfare comes first. It's not that hard a concept. Every time you make a decision, you have to pause and think what's best for the patient in this circumstance, not what's best for the bottom line. I agree with that entirely. And I think that sort of summarizes, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what, what's wrong with healthcare uh, now. Big business and government, pharma, pharma have, have come in and co-opted uh, this in 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 the guise that it's just a business and it, and it's not and um so i i think to solve the problem um we we need to at at all of the decision points uh ask the question uh what is best for the for the physician doctor uh the f physician patient relationship uh and uh there's a lot of you know little areas that have been eroded and and, and uh, destroyed. And uh, I think that that's the key to, to fixing those things. I agree. Yeah, the, the subtitle for my book, A Partnership for Your Health, is to indicate that patients and physicians need to join in a literal partnership to move forward with what's best for each patient in each situation. The, dis the disturbing part is that as patients and physicians, I think we want the same thing, but we don't have the power to institute it. The people who have the power, decision makers in the pharmaceutical companies, health insurance companies, hospital systems, and politicians, they have the power to make change, but they don't have the incentive because they're content financially with the way things are going. So I'm trying to endorse yeah. that patients see us physicians as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Hospitals are yeah. perfectly happy to pit us against each other They by diminishing the amount of time we can spend with patients and if we feel stressed and then asking the patient, what were you satisfied about in terms of the care by Dr. Remignante or Dr. Lyons, you know, and, and basically they take those complaints and they roll them up like a piece of like an old newspaper, like you're going to hit a bad dog and they hit us with it. I think patients need yeah. to understand that we are on their side in this. And one thing I'm doing yeah. to work towards that is I actually have come up with a talk and I've only given it one so far. I have a friend, she's a nurse and a lawyer, and she had to stop working due to Parkinson symptoms. And uh, I gave a talk and it was called to the tune of like how caring for your doctor gets you better care, just to let patients know how difficult things are for physicians right now and why they should care. And because if you have a doctor that is struggling with mental health issues or is, you know, burnt out, exhausted, overwhelmed, it's of course, it's going to affect, uh, you know, your care. So even if uh, patients look at it from a selfish point of view, right, that they need to care about uh, their doctors. And uh, Dr. Kathy Stepien says, I've quoted her many times, everyone wins when physicians are well. So I have after yeah. I gave that talk once, I've um, modified it a bit. And when we're done here, I'll send you both the draft and you can give me some feedback. And then I'm sure. going to do another episode where I would like to do that with uh, my friend, Pat, who uh, who had me on uh, with her Parkinson's group. I think I think I think that we should always think about the exam room or in your case, in the emergency room that. Uh, you you see um, you know a hundred people with the same diseases and you can't cookbook that uh, you know as as you go back and forth with 
with the patient, uh, there's little nuances and uh, connections in, in the brain and, and uh, in a relationship with people. And uh, you just, you can't, you can't change, I, you know, AI, uh, there's some incredible things with AI, but I mean, for example, this uh, administrator that I described as a Bible study, he was really excited about AI. And he, I think in, in his mind, didn't say this, but in his mind was it's going to replace physicians. Mm -hmm. Nobody can replace physicians. A good doctor is irreplaceable. And I know that multiple times over from personal experience. Yes. Yes. I don't know if either of you have read that book called Compassionomics by Dr. Treciak and Mazzarelli. It's I, I haven't, no. No. Basically, they make the science-based argument for why a compassionate interaction between a patient and physician is healing all by itself. Mm -hmm. And really, compassionate interactions are healing, if you think of it in a spiritual aspect, between any two living beings, even between animals and people. Mm -hmm. And yes. what, what modern healthcare is telling us, there's no time for compassion, which is not true. It doesn't really take much time to add a compassionate word. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, my my wife my wife has a a, a problem, a medical problem right now, and she just got an appointment with a, a new physician, and just just the fact that there's somebody who she's going to see has has helped her. Uh, so that sort of goes with what you're talking about. That relationship itself is healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Drew, is there anything you really want us to to know about your book? That we haven't touched on. I, I mean, I dog-eared so many pages. It really is a fantastic book. Yeah, I'd like people to take the time to give it a read. I don't. I, I prefer if you bought it. That'd be grand. But on the other hand, if <laughs> ten people bought my book and nobody read it, and five people took it out of the library and they all read it, I'd take that second scenario anytime. Yeah, I think it explains yeah. a lot of things in detail that it's hard to encapsulate in a few sentences. And. Uh, Again, it's the main thing, which it's a hopefully a convincing argument for why you should partner with your physician. You can't be a passive participant in your health care. You need to be an active participant, a knowledgeable one. You need to find a physician who can work with you in the way that you want to work. You know, uh, you can communicate back and forth. Uh, and the amazing thing when I was doing the research for my book is that that type of relationship in which you have a mutually trusting relationship it doesn't have a minor impact on your health. It cuts the mortality rate in half, I'm study after study after study. I'm, if there was a medical intervention that said uh, that could scientifically prove that it reduced mortality by half, you know, people would be winning Nobel prizes for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't hear yeah, about these oh, yeah. studies. You don't hear about these studies because you can't monetize them. They're simple things like you need to be compassionate with your fellow human beings. A lot of them are spiritual in nature. You need to get out of yourself and you need, to, of course, you need to be compliant with your medicines and adhering to the plan, but you don't, but you can't be a par passive participant when you're in the office with the doctor. You need to, when you're sitting there listening to your physician or your physical therapist, whoever is talking to you, you have to, you have to say to yourself, when I leave here today, I'm going to have to do everything that we agreed to do. And if you went in with that understanding, you wouldn't sit there passively. When you had a question, you'd raise that question. Mm hmm so I, I think people, you know, I'd like people to become more energized, more activated, more knowledgeable patients. And again, the payoff is huge. It's not a small payoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your book illustrates that very well. Um, so thank you very much for writing it. And um, Bill, what would you like us to know about your publications? Um. Well, on on the topic that we're talking about, it, primarily essays that I've written, uh, um, uh, and um, then I write medical, primarily medical fiction, and uh, I, I echo what Drew just said. Yeah, it'd be great if people buy, uh, but I'm, I'm more interested in that they they get something out of it, and. Uh, so Drew's book, um, what what I've read of, it, I I don't have a copy of it, but I I should I should buy one. <laughs> but, uh, or get it out of the uh, library, Bill. <laughs> yeah, right. A library. Uh, do they still have those? But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, 
I I read through it and it's like, is this guy talking like me? Is this is this mm-hmm. me or uh, mm-hmm. and because uh, I I disagreed with everything he was talking about. We we really come from the same uh, point of view uh, in regards to uh, the healthcare system and its problems. So. Hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you. So now I'm wondering if uh, you each have any top tips that uh, for your colleagues from seasoned physicians to medical students or even those considering med school. Wow. And to, when I wrote the book, I wrote I wrote my book thinking, gee, what are the kind of things I wish I had known in medical school? And uh, it's, uh, you know, so that's really why I, I wrote it the way I wrote it. Uh, and that. Uh, I feel for those people who are entering medical school now. Unfortunately, more than half of them now are women, unlike in our day, Bill. And I think that's a change for the better. You know, women aren't represented yep. across the board in healthcare yet, but they will be shortly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know. I, I would just like to say that um, I, th- I think the person in, entering uh, medicine uh, nowadays needs to look forward uh, to what they're going to be involved with. Um, I think that physician burnout uh, is is a widespread, uh, maybe increasing problem. Uh, and um, I, I wish in medical schools there was a uh, simultaneous course which talked about what it's like to practice medicine. Uh, this would be talking about financial um, planning. This will be talking about your your own um, life, uh, having a well-rounded life and uh, attention to health, uh, your own health uh, and things like that. Uh, but I, I think people who, who, who go to medical school, who go into the health uh, profession uh, need, need to be a little wary uh, it is a, like I mentioned, it's a noble profession and it is definitely worthwhile going into the field. Uh, but, uh, it has this uh, sort of fog hanging over it. And, uh, but with attention to, uh, uh, several, uh, things, uh, I, I think people can weather that and have a, have a very, uh, creative, uh, enjoyable, rewarding, um, career. Yeah, I would just add one more cent to my two cents, which is that I mean, the high tech changes in healthcare have been phenomenal, especially those things that we're able to do now in emergency medicine that we didn't used to be able to do. Number one, sedate people before we intubated them, <laughs> which we didn't used to be able to do. Um, and uh, but uh, the high tech changes are great, and students now should benefit from all the high tech things they can do, especially bedside portable ultrasound by physicians is a wonderful touch. A wonderful technique, but they shouldn't lose track of the fact that high talk and high touch medicine should never go away. And that's one of the threats of AI. AI might be able to manufacture speech to you, but it can never touch you and examine you and, and be right there next to you and, and see what needs to be seen. So I agree. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Absolutely. Um, do you have a suggestion for patients who wish to support their doctors? I would I would say briefly, if you had an interaction with your physician that didn't go well, you should the next time say, gee, you know, you should articulate that. If, if you want to keep that physician, you, want, you need to articulate your disappointments. And I would not rely on those press gainy mm-hmm. evaluation forms you get. If you had a bad... Uh, experience in the hospital, you should pick up the phone and say, I want to speak to the CEO of the hospital to let them know. You won't get the CEO, of course, because they never interact with patients. And he's, he, I press further, I'd say, well, who can I speak to in place of the CEO? I get somebody live and I'd say, hey, gee, I noticed when I spent six hours in the emergency department, the staff were running around frantically taking care of people. Why don't you have more staff so that people can be seen more efficiently? And uh, so I would complain to the powers that be and and say then at the end of your conversation, gee, if, if things don't improve at XYZ hospital, I'm going to go across town to ABC hospital and vote with your feet or threaten to vote with your feet. That'll get their attention because that's really what they're interested in is the dollars that they can draw from you. Mm-hmm. Right. And if they need more manpower, if you share that in a respectful way, 
that then that helps the other doctors, right? If they are able to get some help. So yeah, so patients need to be aware of these issues. Um, Bill, did you have a final uh, thought on if there's anything patients wish to do to support their doctors? Um, I, I would agree with Drew. I think that um, um, voicing your concerns, that makes a big difference. I mean, as I think back on my career, um, you know, a few messages uh, really stick out that I can still remember. Uh, and so oh, I think uh, encourage patients uh, to, um, to, to voice their concerns. And, and I think uh, communication is always uh, the solution to problems like that. Uh, but so often, yeah, we fill out a complaint form and you read it and, you know, it just doesn't touch you like if, if they picked up the phone or if they actually talked to you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, thank you both very much for being my guest today. And you've shared some links with me, which I'll share in our uh, show notes. And when I um, publish the episode, not only on YouTube, but on LinkedIn as well. Um, so thanks okay. again. I was thrilled to have both of you. Thank you, Kim, for having That's us so on. And nice to meet you, Bill. And like I say, I'm glad we're still rattling around. I'm hoping to rattle around for another <laughs> yeah. couple of decades. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Glad to, <laughs> glad to finally vir vir virtually meet you someday, maybe in person. But uh, yes, I, I, I so uh, yeah, that would be enjoyed. awesome. <laughs> Uh, yep. So in closing, to move the needle in healthcare, we all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other. We already know that doctors need to care about patients. Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors. Well said. Great. I agree.